everyone, welcome to World Inside, coming to you live from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, stepping into a new era, Chinese President Xi Jinping launches the biggest reform of China's military since the 1950s, shedding off dead weights to make way for a smarter and stronger force. And the great race, the hottest new cars, the wow crowds at this year's Beijing Auto Show with new energy and driverless models taking the spotlight at China's biggest annual car event. We begin today's discussion with China's military reforms. Chinese President Xi Jinping recently visited the Central Military Commission's Joint Battle Command Center, where he underlined the need for creation and reform within the army to build a comprehensive, integrated, and effective command system. The president's speech came after he pushed the biggest military reform last year, which emphasized the modernization of China's forces. China's military has been shouldering more international responsibilities in recent years. So how will China's army me to develop. Before we go into our discussion, let's take a look at this. A new and improved military. Greeted by officers and soldiers, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited the army's Joint Battle Command Center. Xi urged the army to implement a set of military strategies and tactics that would bring China's armed forces up to date with the current landscape. He also stressed deepening reforms to create a stronger Chinese army. Earlier this year, China carried out a series of military reforms to build what it called a modern military by 2020. This is a big shift from its decades-old land-centric system towards a joint command system that will upgrade the army's overall capabilities. The reform statement clarifies why there's a need to reform, what to reform, how to reform. It makes clear requirements for the army. And Troop numbers have been cut by 300,000 to make way for new high-tech equipment and structures. And the long-standing seven military regions have been regrouped with battle command zones created for a focus on combat. So the idea here is that future wars will be fought jointly. So the Air Force, Navy, um, rocket forces are going to be much more important space capabilities. And I think a lot of this reorganization is trying to bring those elements to the fore while saying to the ground forces, look, you're still important, but future wars are going to have at least as much having to do with space capabilities and maritime capabilities. The Navy's capability is set to improve by leaps and bounds through the joint operation. April 23rd marks the 67 years of the Navy's establishment. Through the decades, China has managed to develop greater naval weapons and equipment. With domestic technological advancements, aircraft carriers, new destroyers and submarines have been developed. The country's maritime defense system has been taking shape. The open debates by China and the U.S. on the South China Sea issue in the recent years have garnered a lot of attention. It looks unlikely that the differences can be resolved in the near future. Still, talks continue with hopes that this issue can someday cease to be an obstacle in Sino-U.S. relations. And for more on China's uh, military reform and the latest uh, movement uh, on the military front, we're joined here in the Beijing studio by two panelists, uh, Mr. Ye Hailin, who is a researcher at the National Institute of International Strategy with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, and also Mr. Zhang Junshe from the China Naval Research Institute. Meanwhile, in Newton, we have Rob Ross, professor of political science, at Boston College, he's also an associate at John King Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Last but not least, we have uh, in Washington, D.C., in the United States, uh, Greg Poling, who is the uh, director of the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Gentlemen, for all of you, very strong panel, welcome to our program. What do you make, uh, first of all? from the Chinese military's perspective of the recent step by the Chinese President Xi Jinping to have this, what he calls the new Joint Forces Battle Command Center. What is the function of it? How is that compared to the previous China's army system or military system, shall I say? Well, now <coughs> he sits there as the commander-in-chief 
of the uh, PRA forces and also the commander in chief of the combat uh, command center. Uh, actually, previously, all the presidents uh, or, or the secretary general uh, also of the party have been the commander in chief uh, uh, because he, uh, these people have been the chairmen of the CMC. Mm. So now I think that we will strengthen the joint combat uh, command capabilities of the PRA. Mm. Uh, Mr. Ross, though, what do you make of it, Professor Ross, of this latest development from the Chinese side? And uh, what kind of signal is it sending uh, in a way about uh, China's uh, military way forward? I think it's clear this is one more step in the development of the Chinese Navy. China's uh, ground borders, its frontiers have never been more secure. The need to continue large investments in the Army is diminishing, and the budget of the Navy is growing. But unlike in the past, the Navy is dependent on advanced communication technologies to be able to operate for command, control, and communication. And that means satellites. That means interoperability. It means jointness. In addition, it means being able to operate with the Air Force, because, ground, because support for the Air Force, air support for the Navy is critical for naval operations. So we're seeing jointness become part the Chinese Navy, Chinese Army's doctrine. This will, this will go forward as the Chinese Navy continues to expand its operations in the Western Pacific, the East China Sea, the South China Sea. How shall we, Mr. Ye, sitting in Beijing, understand the relations between the new development on this front, as we mentioned, also analyzed by the two pre previous speakers, and the apparent crisis, territorial disputes, going on in the South China Sea East China Sea, as well as China's uh, international responsibilities when it comes to the military. Just like the, most of the other countries, all, almost all the, uh, all the countries' military, uh, military doctrine is based on their task and uh, threat. But there's, uh, to, be, uh, to, be, to be accurate, there's only one country, their military doctrine is not based on their threat, it's based on the capacity. That's America, it's not China. But for China, of course, China, this military doctrine is based on threat and a task. So we can clear or notice that since the 2014, Chinese maritime security issue get more uh, important and more crucial. So that's why the reason China, Chinese military system and the military doctrine had to make some update and reform to uh, suitable for the new and um, new change of the maritime issue. So I think this uh, Russ is correct. That's the all the reform is based on the task. What do you want to do? Mm. And you hire to, based on to reshape the whole structure. Right. And also this structure is a follow the modernization process of the PRA. Mr. Pauling, hearing it from the United States, uh, what does it mean for the U.S. Uh, Navy and also U.S. Uh, international responsibility as well as Asia Pacific vision if you have a stronger Navy from China? Well, I think there's, there's two competing uh, narratives there. One is, uh, as the Chinese Navy takes over greater and greater uh, responsibilities, as it steps out more into the region, we're seeing an understandable spike in competition in the near waters, uh, the East China Sea and the South China Sea. At the same time, the U.S. does welcome the role of the Chinese Navy as it becomes a real blue water Navy abroad uh, in places like uh, off the coast of Somalia and anti-piracy operations. And we're going to continue to see those two competing uh, impetuses, I think, for, for years to come. All right, very brief answers from our American guest. Uh, so let me come back to you, also from the Navy, <laughs> Mr. Jiang here in Beijing. Uh, China's military building, if our American guest uh, is not mentioning it, I have to mention it because uh, it is being used, at least that phrase, in some uh, international media reports, suggesting it could be China aggression in the neighboring water surrounding China toward the other countries. Is that going to be the case? What kind of capabilities is Chinese Navy developing right now? What are their tasks, as being mentioned by Mr. Ye, who is, of course, coming from the civilian side? Well, I think uh, <coughs> there are two in some uh, aspect, uh, because of the, most of the threats uh, China is facing come from the sea. And uh, second, most of the international uh, uh, applications and duties also come from the sea. We can see this from the joint 
uh, anti-piracy and escort operations the Chinese Navy has been conducting since 2008 in the Gulf of Aden and waters of Somalia. And in the future, I think the Chinese Navy should develop its capabilities in two directions. One is is commensurate with the status of China as an uh, international power, and also we, first we should have the ability to safeguard national sovereignty, security, and the development interests. On the other hand, we should develop the capabilities to conduct remote operations in the overseas uh, to uh, carry out more international responsibilities and duties as the anti-piracy operations. On safeguarding China's sovereignty, earlier we have already talked briefly with Mr. Ye in Beijing about the territorial disputes in the South China Sea and East China Sea. What would that mean, the increasing capability of the Chinese Navy in terms of supporting uh, China in uh, its uh, sovereignty uh, debate with other countries? How does the the geopolitical political debates work together with China's military advancement? Well, I think uh, the one of the priorities of the Chinese Navy is to safeguard national security. But uh, concerning the East China Sea and South China Sea uh, disputes, I think China has been exercising great restraint in using military strength. Uh, uh, either in the East China Sea or in the North, South China Sea. We haven't sent our naval forces to join uh, the control or uh, join the joint patrols with the Coast Guard. And we, of course, the, the Navy stands there as a backbone for the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. But the Coast Guard and civilian vessels are in the front to deal with uh, the issues and disputes between China and the other countries. I think this is the best way for us to handle uh, to resolve such issues. Mr. Ross, would you agree? Yes, I would. And to comment on your, your observation that some observers have thought that China is behaving aggressively or with belligerently, um, I think we should understand that this is to be expected behavior from a rising power who looks at its maritime security as problematic. Um, as Chinese leaders have now said, um, China has two objectives, to defend its sovereignty and maintain stability, something China could not have done before. And of course, U.S. dominance of Chinese coastal waters is a problem for China. Having said that, this is nonetheless creates a conflict of interest between the United States and China. Just because China wants more doesn't mean that's good for the United States. So the dilemma for the two countries is how to manage a conflict of interest while maintaining stability and cooperation. And admittedly, this has been difficult for both sides. As Xi Jinping had said, defend sovereignty, maintain stability, but stability has been a problem. If the United States maintain its presence, maintain the balance, reassure its allies, but maintain cooperation with China, this too has been difficult. This all reflects rising China, new capabilities, conflicts of interest, which neither side is very accustomed to. So this will be a challenge going forward as we can expect the Chinese Navy to become more powerful and the challenges to become greater. Mm. Of course, this is coming from the academic and civilian side from the U.S., but what about from the military mm. side? Even though you are uh, an academic yourself, uh, Mr. Pauling, but I'm sure you've got some uh, military background yourself as well. So having heard what Mr. Ross uh, has uh, articulated for us, uh, what would be the appropriate strategies then, you think? from the U.S. Navy and also from the U.S. military side, when you have a rising power, when you have a rising power eager to maintain stability and also protect its water sovereignty, at least as they believe so. Right, well, so the U.S. is already responding. I mean, we've seen a lot about uh, the plans to move eventually 60% of total U.S. naval strength into the Pacific, uh, including the most advanced, the largest uh, of, of our surface ships, our, our subs, et cetera. Uh, the same with the Air Force boosting U.S. air capability in the Asia Pacific. All of this uh, in preparation for uh, the day that hopefully never comes when we do see uh, the Chinese Navy used uh, for in, out front in these disputes. But here and now, the problem for the U.S. is really how to respond given that the Chinese Navy is not the one out in front. It is primarily the Coast Guard and uh, the, the Chinese maritime militias that are out there uh, I wouldn't say necessarily aggression, but bullying 
Southeast Asian claim. It's in which you know, the U.S. Navy cannot respond forcefully in what is effectively a law enforcement activity or dispute between China and Southeast Asian partners. Mm -hmm. So it is often left sitting on the sidelines, uh, presenting perhaps a deterrent by putting U.S. naval ships just over the horizon, so to speak. It ensures that Chinese naval ships also stay over the horizon. Uh, but that leaves it to the much larger, much more advanced Chinese Coast Guard and, and civilian vessels uh, to run right over their smaller Southeast Asian partners. Uh, may I also follow up a little bit, if uh, Mr. Pauling, you allow me, uh, which is what would be the function then uh, coming from the Pentagon, for example, when you have the flying over of the U.S. planes and also the military ships in the territory that China believes at least have a territorial dispute case with some of the neighboring countries. Uh, what would be the function of that? And also, is that already part of the very strategic thinking of the U.S. Navy and U.S. military, or is only a sporadic, a temporary response uh, should there be a systematic approach? Well, I think there is a systematic approach, and the, you know, the so-called freedom of navigation operations that you're alluding to uh, are part of that, but just one small part. The U.S. does not have an interest in the territorial disputes, whether in the East China Sea or the South China Sea. It does not particularly care who has sovereignty over which reef or which islet. Right. It does have an interest in the maritime disputes. It sees itself as a defender of international law, and it sees China's actions and claims in the South China Sea especially as contrary to the international law. Regardless of who controls the islands, China's making claims to the waters that are very excessive, that are not All based right. in international law as the U.S. sees it. And the purpose of these operations is simply to uh, assert that by the U.S., for instance, sailing or, or operating near artificial islands, okay. it's saying that under national law, it does not see any claim from them. All right, Mr. Ye, <laughs> uh, respond first of all, and secondly, how does China see these approaches coming from the United States? Have China responded yeah. correctly, at least according to you from the civilian who, side? Uh, the first question is uh, who makes the situation worse and who has to respond to it? There's a, diff well, there's a lot of questions. Yeah, there's a lot of questions and China and the U.S. has a fully different understanding that who shoot the first shot. And, but secondly, uh, this might also be my point. Yeah, America also emphasized that, uh, that there's an international law that's not uh, pick up the side of the sovereign, uh, sovereignty dispute. But for the record, for the last 40 years, all, uh, a lot of the Chinese neighboring country, I mean, the, uh, on the water, they do the same thing China did right now, but the American remain silent. So it's really difficult for China to accept such kind of the opinion that America has no opinion over okay. the, the territorial dispute. So in, in China's understanding that uh, this freedom navigation is targeting on China, so that China has to, has to make the response. So this uh, question, go back to our first question, that who has to respond to the other side? Okay, well, Mr. Ye has very passionately raised more questions than, than answering the, an the, the questions, <laughs> but <laughs> let me go to you, Senior Colonel Zhang. Uh, what do you say uh, about the U.S. approach uh, as a result? Has China got, at this moment, with this joint command center, a systematic approach as to how it wants to align all of these civilian forces together with the military and also particular Navy to safeguard its sovereignty? What does that mean for Navy's growth in this country? Well, I think the streamline of these uh, military organizations, uh, the focus of that is to strengthen our joint combat uh, command uh, capabilities uh, because we have now the uh, joint combat command system which runs from the CMC uh, to the five uh, battle zones and to the troops. Right. In this way, we can uh, shorten the command at the time uh, protest between the highest command to the lowest level of troops and this can pro uh, improve the proficiency in fighting. All right, uh, Professor Ross, I have to come back to you. You've been attentively listened to your three other colleagues, and you have been and China hand in the United States for decades. Um, Taiwan issue, uh, U.S.-China relations, now South China Sea, and many others. Uh, what would you say? Do you see a clear-cut plans coming from both militaries, and how do you see? the interactions among these militaries, the two of them, uh, these days, uh, with the latest development from China? 
I think the trend in both militaries is to respond to pressure, respond to constraint with more assertiveness. So as the United States puts pressure on China from freedom of navigation cruises, from sailing close and flying close to Chinese installations, opposing Chinese land building in the South China Sea, China pushes back stronger. And when China pushes its claims to the South China Sea and builds its islands, the United States Navy pushes back stronger. So we're in this cycle, we're in this escalatory cycle where neither side is exercising restraint and it's not clear that the political interests of the two countries, the interest in cooperation and stability, are, have a role to play thus far in how we're responding to each other's initiatives. So it's very important at this time for both sides to ask themselves, where can we exercise restraint? Where can we not push back against the other? Where can we make a concession or ease our activities so as to reassure the other that they're not bent on expansion or resistance? Thus far, neither side has signaled an interest in that. We're, of course, going to have a challenge coming up soon with the court resolution or the court response to the Philippine claims. And should that go against China, there will be some pressure on both sides to ease that tension. And it's not clear how they'll respond. Mm. Is this is a concession issue mm. or is this is a principal issue, Mr. Yeh? No, well, that is to say, that okay. is to say we have an international court opinion coming up. All right. And should the ruling go against China, um, the Chinese m themselves may feel the need to, to substantiate their claim, and the Americans may feel the need to support the Philippines. All right. Once okay. again, we'll be in this position of each side putting pressure on the other. That is already a big scenario <laughs> over there. Mr. Yi, an immediate scenario, yeah. in fact, uh, an immediate response? I think it's still, Briefly. It's still a bit, little bit early to say this is a principal issue. I think there's still, for both countries, have some space room to make some concession. Mm. Mr. Zhang? Uh, I, I think. First, I want to say that the South China Sea issue is an issue between China and some of the ASEAN countries, not an issue between China and the United States. And the United States doesn't have need to meddle in this area, and it needn't send its warships to this area. It, it just uh, provokes tensions in this area. So the root cause of tensions now in the South China Sea is the United States who sent his uh, military warships and aircraft to this area. Okay, and final words from you, Mr. Pauling, issue of concession or issue of principle? What's next between the military and the political side? Political side said, we need to move forward about the bilateral relations. Can the militaries follow? I think both militaries are showing restraint in that neither of them are coming to blows out there, but the fact is that we do have two principles that so far are diametrically opposed. The U.S. is right. not willing to cede this question of international law, and China's not willing to cede its claims in the South China Sea. Until one of those sides changes, we're going to be in this trajectory. Very interesting situation, I have to say, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your input, all, the t all of you, four of you, really. Ye Hailin, Zhang Junshe in Beijing, uh, Robert Ross inside the United States, together with Greg Wally. Really appreciate, gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you. Stay with us here on World Insight. We've got our final segment coming right up. Stealing the spotlight, the new energy and driverless models take center stage at the 2016 Beijing Auto Show, turning up the heat at China's biggest annual car event. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight on CCTV News. Themed Innovation and Reform, the 14th Beijing International Automotive Exhibition kicked off on Monday in Beijing, attracting more than 1,600 enterprises from 14 countries. Car makers are seeking high-tech partners to help them implement artificial intelligence, big data, and eventually automotive driving. So who's in the lead in the race to perfect driverless vehicles. Take a look. We learned how to drive on wheels in the past century. Now we teach that to vehicles. This matters to the Chinese market where roads are crowded, drivers are under stress, and fatalities are on the rise. Boston Consulting Group says China will soon corner more than a quarter of the driverless car market, which is expected to hit 12 million cars by 2035. That's why global car makers are geeking out together at Beijing Auto Show 2016. 
The new 7 Series, as you know, can park itself completely automatically without a driver. So we can drive on the highway without putting hands to your steering wheel. We're putting in the street 100 uh, autonomous drive cars uh, and driven by normal customers rather than engineers. We're planning to roll out different tests in different parts of the world, uh, in uh, Europe, U uh, Americas, and uh, Asia. China's Chang'an has wrapped up China's first road test of autonomous driving before the auto show. Chinese IT firms are getting in on the act. Baidu has plans for self-driving buses by 2018. Le Eco at the auto show has an electric car that can park itself and be summoned by smartphone. One expert says, however, the battle for autonomous driving is fought among auto suppliers. Autonomous drive technology, it uh, comes from the traditional uh, hockey active safety. A lot of suppliers working in this area and they want to use this kind of technology to improve their value added. So they are, they are quite eager to invest in this, in, in this second. And that includes investments into localized technologies in China, think Continental. We will localize ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, also in China. Uh, we are already investing into equipment in a factory near Shanghai, and we will ramp that up then next year and the years to come. So automated driving will be an issue in China where we are prepared and we get prepared our investments here like in Europe and US. So we will not have a time lag, it will start in parallel. The company plans to test their technology on the wild Chinese roads within this year. Bosch claims automotive driving system will bump up annual sales by 1 billion euro this year. It's also investing in high-def mapping and smart garage. We are in strong cooperation with every provider of maps and maps are essential to be integrated for automated, uh, for automated driving. We have to differentiate parking and driving. Right. And uh, in the parking sector, there are a lot of uh, next steps available. Yeah. So automatic valid parking, home zone parking, uh, and so on. And so this will be uh, the first steps. Roland Berger says in 20 years, driverless cars will no longer be owned by people, but by fleet management services. That model is expected to work well in China. And let's say if China could come up with more supportive measures and higher safety standards for the sector, it will truly mobilize the world's largest auto market. Xia Cheng, CCTV, Beijing. And for more on the latest development of the driverless cars and many other fascinating aspects, we are joined here in the Beijing studio by Mr. Lu Tic, who is the general manager of uh, JAC Design Center in Italy and also JAC's global design president. Welcome to our program. Also joining us here in Beijing, we have uh, Mr. Samuel Shufa, who is the design director for Icona. Welcome as well. And joining us from Washington, D.C. in the United States, uh, we are having Mr. Levi Tillman, who is the managing partner of Valence Strategies and also author of the book, The Great Race, The Global Quest for the Car of the Future. Welcome as well. Fascinating, fascinating, and fascinating. Driverless cars really is the topic many people are talking about these days. What about its latest development? How far are we, really, from the two of you? Uh, are we from the real driverless car that is supposed to be safe? Mr. Wow. Tick? Well, I think uh, it's not far. I mean, things are coming. and uh, there There's some hesitation in your voice. Is that far or not far? It's not far. <laughs> it's definitely not far. Uh -huh. It's coming very soon. I think there's uh, dozens of companies doing that really deep development into this field, which in U.S. and also, a lot of majority investment doing putting in also China. Mm. JAC as uh, the number eight of Chinese automotive maker, we are investing also a lot in the driverless car and the autonomous driving as well. For the driverless car, you are already having your trials in China. Yes, so we have our uh, demi car, which we have around a hundred thousand kilometers on road testing already okay. in China. Interesting. And what about you, Mr. Shufa? 
Well, I can see for myself as you work for several manufacturers that uh, many of them are actually developing this. And if they don't say so, it's because they are a little bit behind and they see what the other guys are going to develop. In fact, uh, the main issue that we see now is not technical. We know that Volvo, Nissan as well, have yeah. been advertising very loudly this technology that they, I believe, control very well. Google, we can also say, have made a huge trial and control it. Mm. Uh, the real issue, I believe, is in fact in the car insurance. Uh, and uh, everything uh, that uh, will will come from this, you know, whether the consumer will accept that uh, this is whether it's partly his responsibility, uh, or he would uh, go back towards the manufacturers. All right, and uh, Mr. Tillman, how far do you think, really? If you could give us a number, that would be really great. <laughs> well, I think Samuel is exactly right. The technology is making swift progress, and so. Um, although the United States and some of the companies that are based here are in the lead, I think the Chinese companies are also able to close the gap fairly quickly from a technical standpoint. Um, but where we do see a lot of problems to overcome, and where China has a real opportunity to perhaps leapfrog the rest of the pack, is in the policy that governs autonomous vehicles, because that is poised to be a real obstacle to autonomous vehicle deployment, and everyone is working their way through the policy issues right now. So, so if you were to just take policy off the table, I would say that 2020 would mm -hmm. be a good target year for high level three, perhaps level four autonomous vehicles. What that means um, when we say level three is a car that can essentially drive itself within certain settings, perhaps on the highway. Level four is an autonomous vehicle that can drive itself in basically all settings. Mm -hmm. um, 2025, I would say, is a far out prediction. You know, I think if we don't have these vehicles ready by 2025, mm -hmm. I'll be surprised. Interesting. Uh, internationally, uh, Mr. Tick, we already heard uh, that in the city of London, for example, next year there will also be trials uh, or massive trials of the driverless cars on the street. That's at least according to the British government. And secondly, you've got Google testing in different kinds of geographical and temperature locations uh, throughout the United States just to see the heat, you know, the uh, the sand and also the atmosphere, what would that mean for the driverless car? These are going already to some very specific stages. When is China going to be? You didn't give an answer about the timing. I'm sure you can be more specific this time. Uh, well, it's uh, actually a good point and a good question. Mm. Uh, good I question because you have an answer or not have an answer? <laughs> no, I mean, I think I might have a half answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Levy say, the, polit the politic of the driverless car is uh, one of the most optical to put the actual the driverless car on the road mm. because uh, road is complicated. How can you mix with the driverless car and with the drive car? You know, and uh, how the car in artificial intelligence can we at a really good way, but what about humans? Right. And when this have the conflict, and uh, who take the responsibility, and who set the law and the rule to define the right and wrong side? The rule is exactly the point. Exactly. What about the rules? There are several points about the rules. First of all, uh, Mr. Shofa, is what about the road policy? Driverless cars, non-driverless cars, uh, who's going to be responsible for what? That's one thing. Secondly, uh, what about uh, some of the uh, specific numbers of possible accidents? Uh, Google, for example, recently already gave a number, possibly 30,000 uh, uh, accidents are likely to happen, even with driverless car. It is already much fewer than human-caused accidents, but we've already know at the very beginning of the year we are likely to have more than 30,000. Can people accept that? So these are all very important aspects of the policy. We are accepting to take the plane which spend most of its time with a computer flying the plane. Mm. But nevertheless, we also would not be comfortable, I believe, if the pilot was not qualified. And this is a very, that's where we start seeing the change here of who is the user? Is the user somebody capable mm. or incapable? Uh, you were asking the question when? In China, never soon enough. It is clear that in China, it, the roads will be a better place if uh, people will have a driverless cars and the cars will be uh, 
uh, doing the things you know smoothly maybe uh, and I think there are a number of countries where this will help a lot yeah. uh, in other places uh, we have uh, some more questions even in top of that one which is what becomes the definition of the car if the car has no longer a driver and the car becomes a very different kind of product like the phone we, we saw the, the phone industry has changed definition to a certain extent yes, the, the, the winner of yesterday such as Nokia is now a complete loser and uh, Apple is a winner today tomorrow who knows things can change. Kodak, another example. So technology can bring us in an evolution, what seems to be an evolution, the, the digital camera uh, might make tomorrow the losers. Mm. So all of these unpredictabilities would pose certain kinds of challenges to the policy setting. In other words, sometimes policymakers could be swayed by very strong interest groups to move one direction or the other. Uh, Mr. Tillman, what about policy-wise from the U.S.? After all, Google is still a company based in the U.S. Uh, and is having the most advanced uh, technologies as we see. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to remember is that once you get to level four autonomy, that's a fully autonomous vehicle, these really aren't cars in the traditional sense mm. anymore. They're robots. Uh, sometimes we call them car bots. And so what that means is the regulatory structure ought to be quite different from the one that we have today for cars. Today, we have something called the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards that dictate all sorts of things about how you have to put a car together, where the high beam headlight button has to be, how certain hoses have to be clamped. And that's just going to be fundamentally different for an mm. autonomous vehicle. Um, right now, the United States policy approach to autonomous vehicles is a little bit diffuse. You have on the federal level, the Department of Transportation working through some regulatory processes where they're going to recommend a set of regulations to govern autonomous vehicles, but also on a state level, you have state legislatures, and then you have um, surprisingly powerful forces like the California Department of Motor Vehicles mm -hmm. also working on their own separate tracks to govern autonomous cars. And so it's a very complicated, messy story right now, and it's going to be very interesting to see how it shakes out. Mm. Of course, the U.S. has always been a very interesting story because of the federal system it has, uh, the state vis-a-vis -vis national. But what about another area, uh, which is who is going to be the winners and who is going to be the losers? And now we talk about uh, Google and Uber and many of the so-called new companies very eager to push forward driverless cars. Meanwhile, you also got traditional automakers trying to, at least just like your companies, mm -hmm. try to set one part of it uh, focusing on driverless cars. But this could also mean challenges for these traditional auto industry. Uh, according to some estimates, General Motors, for example, and Ford companies, if uh, 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 driverless cars could become somewhat mainstream by the year 2020, as Mr. Tillman mentioned earlier, has to cut their workforce by a huge uh, chunk. And even their research centers around the world, manufacturer centers around the world from more than 30 to only 17. That at least is the current number we could have. So having said that though, Mr. Tick, who is going to be the winners and who is going to be the losers? If the auto industry is going to have a swaying heart, um, what would that mean for the speed of the technology and the cooperation between the policy side and also the auto industry? Uh, well, it's, uh, also it's a lot of questions. Another good <laughs> question. Uh, I think, you know, there's not a clear winner or loser. You know, the traditional automaker like us, we will have to work with the uh, upcoming players from internet side, mm. which are focused uh, really much in the user experience. Uh, you know, we might join with them, have a joint venture and a joint force or uh, IND team put together to do a new section for the driverless car. You know, which basically really heavily focus on the user experience legislation. But maybe we will work together with the uh, political party to set up the legislation mm. for the driverless car. It must to be. And uh, if we do this way, I think we will be a win-win together. Mm. And uh, otherwise, uh, that would be quite hard to define who would be the winner and the loser. Right. But I think also for uh, the internet, like uh, Google and Apple, which they announced already they're doing the driverless car, okay. 
And then uh, for them, also really hard to do things alone because the automotive industry is a hundred years old industry. And then you have a hundred years of a collection of uh, knowledge, technology, you, the way people use car, I mean, behave. You guys are important. Yes, we understand. But what <laughs> about you, uh, Mr. Chou? <laughs> uh, would this uh, debate, as being mentioned by Mr. Taker, would make everybody a lobbyist? Everybody <laughs> try to work uh, with the policymakers? Will they make uh, the new so-called technology companies go against uh, the automakers or vice versa? As I was hearing the other day, an interview of uh, one of the most uh, renowned automakers of the world, uh, he was suggesting, well, we just heard the news from the media, just as everybody else uh, in the world, about the latest development of the driverless cars. Isn't that interesting? Mr. It Kilman. is. I mean, I think that when you look at the automotive industry right now, um, you have to look at it through 3D, uh, which means three disruptions. You have electrification, you have automation, and then you have new mobility, which is services like Lyft and Uber. And all of these forces are conspiring to fundamentally transform the world of automobiles as we know it today. And it's really too much for any one person to keep up with. Um, we are surprised that at Valence, uh, we have big, sophisticated automotive companies coming to us and saying, hey, you have to come and uh, help us make sense of this because there are just so many new dynamics within mm. the industry that, that it's hard for even very sophisticated, entrenched players to understand how to cope with this shifting landscape. Mm. Uh, Mr. Shufa, eventually before we go, what do you think will be the issue? Is it the technology? Is it the consumer habits? Or is it really the politics? I think the politics is what will help us to make it happen. I think the technology is uh, when people are ready, they are going to be the winners. The people that are not ready are going to be the losers. Uh, but I think that beyond that, beyond that question is going to be what is always the consumer going to use this product. And at that point, uh, this might change the way we use the product. And at that point, if it becomes just a commodity, everybody is actually a loser because mm -hmm. a car is a very emotional car, emotional yes. product. Yes, indeed. Mr. Tillman, your final words, very briefly, 10 seconds. Well, I, I think it's an exciting time. We're going to see more change in the next 10 years than we've seen in the last 100 years. And there are huge opportunities for China here. Okay. Huge opportunities to reduce pollution and to reduce congestion and to make a more efficient, safer society. Mr. Chick, final words. Well, I think uh, the driveless car is the way to go and is a super fit to the city like tier one city like Beijing, Shanghai. It's a giant mega city. And then we will put a lot of effort onto it. Okay, we're looking forward to it. And also, of course, many debates to come. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Lu Tik, yes. Samuel Shufa, and Levi Tillman. Really appreciate, gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you. That is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Inside to CCTV News into your search engine. You will be able to find us. Or you can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone at the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again tomorrow for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.